The drive shaft is connected to the cylinder barrel. As it turns, the pistons move back and forth in the cylinders because they are connected to the swash plate. As the piston retracts, it pulls oil into the cylinder through the inlet port and then ejects it on the downstroke through the outlet port. The amount of oil pumped depends on the angle of the swash plate. When the swash plate is at a maximum angle, there is maximum flow. At zero angle, there is no displacement and no flow. Hydraulic pumps. The hydraulic pump transfers mechanical energy into hydraulic energy. It is a device that takes energy from one source, I, E, engine, electric motor, etc. Closing parenthesis and transfers that energy into a hydraulic form. The function of the pump is to supply the hydraulic system with a sufficient flow of oil to enable the circuits to operate at the correct speed. Pumps can generally be classified into two types. Non-positive displacement. Positive displacement. Figure 49 is showing a gear type pump. The gears are in mesh and rotated by a power source. The pump takes oil from a storage container, i.e. tank and pushes it into a hydraulic system. All pumps produce oil flow in the same way. A partial vacuum is created at the pump inlet and outside pressure. Tank pressure and or atmospheric pressure forces the oil to the inlet passage and into the pump inlet chambers. The pump idler gears carry the oil to the pump outlet chamber with each element of fluid that is discharged from a hydraulic pump. An equal amount must be available at the inlet side to replace it. The availability of the fluid at the inlet is entirely dependent upon the reservoir pressures that force the fluid into the pump. The larger the pump, or the faster the pump runs, the more fluid is needed to replace the amount that is discharged. This will depend upon there being adequate pressure in the reservoir to force fluid into the pump. Without sufficient pressure, starvation of the pump will occur and this will cause severe damage to the pump components and ultimately cause pump failure. There are many factors that can hinder the flow of fluid between the reservoir and the pump. A fluid line that is too small for the volume of fluid going through it. A clogged outlet on the reservoir. A pump that is located too far away from the reservoir or too far above it. A fluid that is too viscous to flow easily. When one or more of these conditions exist to the point that starvation of the pump begins to occur, they must be corrected immediately. Pumps do not produce or cause pressure. The resistance to the flow causes pressure. Resistance can be caused by flow through hoses, orifices, fittings, cylinders, motors, or anything in the system that hinders free flow to the tank. Pumps create flow only. Positive displacement pump. A positive displacement pump will discharge a specified amount of fluid during each revolution or stroke almost regardless of the restriction on the outlet side. Because of this characteristic, positive displacement pumps are nearly always the pump of choice in hydraulic systems. The hand pump illustrated in figure 50 provides an example of the operation of a positive displacement pump. Positive displacement hydraulic pumps are designated by the volume of displacement, such as gallons per minute, liters per minute, cubic inches or cubic centimeters per revolution. This designation is usually a theoretical displacement and does not allow for any losses that may occur within the pump due to internal leakage. Positive displacement pumps have small clearances between components. This reduces leakage and provides a much higher efficiency when used in a high-pressure hydraulic system. The output flow in a positive displacement pump is basically the same for each pump revolution. Both the control of their output flow and the construction of the pump classify positive. Displacement pumps. Positive displacement pumps are rated in two ways. One is by the maximum system pressure. 21,000 kilopascals or 3,000 psi, at which the pump is designed to operate. The second is by the specific output delivered either per revolution or at a given speed against a specified pressure. 
As an example, a pump may be rated in LPM at RPM at KPA, i.e. 380 LPM at 2000 revolutions per minute at 690 kilopascals. When expressed in output per revolution, the flow rate can be easily converted by multiplying by the speed in RPM, i.e. 2000 revolutions per minute, and dividing by constant. For example, we will calculate the flow of a pump that rotates 2,000 revolutions per minute and has a flow of 11.55 in 3 rev 190 cc rev GPM equals in 3 rev XRPM 231 LPM equals cc rev XRPM 1000 GPM equals 11.55 by 2,231st LPM equals 190x 2,000 GPM equals 100 LPM equals 380. The outlet flow of a non-positive displacement pump is dependent on the inlet and outlet. Restrictions. The greater the restriction on the outlet side, the less flow the pump will discharge. An example of a non-positive displacement pump is the water pump rod on an engine. Figure 51. The centrifugal impeller is an example of a non-positive displacement pump and consists of two basic parts. The impeller, two, that is mounted on an input shaft, four, and the housing, three, dot. The impeller has a solid disc back with curved blades, one, molded on the input side. Fluid enters the center of the housing. 5. Near the input shaft and flows into the impeller. The curved impeller blades propel the fluid outward against the housing. The housing is shaped to direct the oil to the outlet port. Gear pumps. Figure 52. Are positive displacement pumps. They deliver the same amount of oil for each revolution of the input shaft. Changing the speed of rotation controls the pump's output. The maximum operating pressure for gear pumps is limited to 27,579 kilopascals, 4,000 psi. Dot. This pressure limitation is due to the hydraulic imbalance that is inherent in the design. The hydraulic imbalance produces a side load on the shafts that is resisted by the bearings of the gear teeth to housing contact. The gear pump maintains a volumetric efficiency above 90% when pressure is kept within the designed operating pressure range. Figure 53 shows the components of the gear pump. Seal retainers. 1. Seals. 2. Seal backups. 3. Isolation plates. 4. Spaces. 5. A drive gear. 6. An idler gear. 7. A housing. 8. A mounting flange, 9. A flange seal, 10. And pressure balance plates, 11. On either side of the gears. Bearings are mounted in the housing and mounting flange on the sides of the gears to support the gear shafts during rotation. Pressure balance plates. There are two different types of pressure balance plates used in gear pumps. Figure 54. Dot. The earlier type. 1. Has a flat back. This type uses an isolation plate, a backup for the seal, a seal shaped like a 3 and a seal retainer. The later type, 2, has a groove shaped like a 3 cut into the back and is thicker than the earlier type. Two different types of seals are used with the later type of pressure balance plates. Gear pump flow. The output flow of the gear pump is determined by the tooth depth and gear width. Most manufacturers standardized on a tooth depth and profile determined by the centerline distance. Opening parenthesis, 1.6, 2.0, 2.5, 3.0, etc. Closing parenthesis, between gear shafts, with standardized tooth depths and profiles, the tooth width totally determines flow differences within each centerline classification. As the pump rotates, figure 55. The gear teeth carry the oil from the inlet to the outlet side of the pump. The direction of rotation of the drive gear shaft is determined by the location of the inlet and outlet ports and drive gear will always move the oil around the outside of the gears from inlet to outlet port. This is true on both gear pumps and gear motors. On most gear pumps the inlet port is larger in diameter than the outlet port to ensure that there 
is always an ample supply of oil for the demand of the system and to ensure pump starvation does not occur. On bi-directional pumps and motors, the inlet port and outlet port will be the same size. Gear pump forces. The outlet flow from a gear pump is created by pushing the oil out of the gear teeth as they come. Intermesh on the outlet side. The resistance to oil flow creates the outlet pressure. The imbalance of the gear pump is due to outlet port pressure being higher than inlet port. Pressure. The higher pressure oil pushes the gears toward the inlet port side of the housing. The shaft bearings carry the majority of the side load to prevent excessive wear between the tooth. Tips and the housing. On the higher pressure pumps, the gear shafts are slightly tapered from the outboard end of the bearings to the gear. This allows full contact between the shaft and bearing as the shaft bends slightly under the unbalanced pressure. The pressurized oil is also directed between the seal area of the pressure balance plates and the housing and mounting flange to seal the ends of the gear teeth. The size of the seal area between the pressure balanced plates and the housing is what limits the amount of force that pushes the plates against the ends of the gears. Vane pump. As shown in figure 56, vane pumps are positive displacement pumps. The pump output can be either fixed or variable. Both the fixed and variable vane pumps use common part nomenclature. Each pump consists of the housing. 1. Cartridge. 2. Mounting plate. 3. Mounting plate seal. 4. Cartridge seals. 5. Cartridge backup rings. 6. Snap ring. 7. And input shaft and bearing. 8. The cartridge consists of the support plates. 9. Displacement ring. 10. Flex plates. 11. Slotted rotor. 12. And the vanes. 13. The input shaft turns the slotted rotor. The vanes move in and out of the slots in the rotor and seal on the outer tips against the cam. Ring. The inside of the fixed pump displacement ring is elliptical in shape. The inside of the variable pump displacement ring is round in shape. The flex plates seal the sides of the rotor and the ends of the vanes. In some lower pressure designs, the support plates and housing seal the sides of the rotating rotor and the ends of the vanes. The support plates are used to direct the oil into the proper passages in the housing. The housing, in addition to providing support for the other parts of the vein pump, directs the flow in and out of the vein pump. The vanes, the vanes, figure 57 are initially held against the displacement ring by centrifugal force created by the rotation of the rotor. As flow increases, the resultant pressure that builds from the resistance to that flow is directed into passages in the rotor beneath the veins. 1. This pressurized oil beneath the veins keep the vein tips pushed against the displacement ring to form a seal to prevent the veins from being pushed too hard against the displacement ring. The veins are beveled back arrow to permit a balancing pressure across the outer end. Flex plates. The same pressurized oil is also directed between the flex plates and the support plates to seal the sides of the rotor and the end of the veins. Figure 58. Dot. The size of the seal area between the flex plates and the support plates is what controls the force. That pushes the flex plates against the sides of the rotor and the end of the veins. The kidney-shaped seals must be installed in the support plates with the rounded O-ring side into the pocket and the flat plastic side against the flex plate. Vein pump operation. When the rotor rotates around the inside of the displacement ring figure 59, the veins slide in and out of the rotor slots to maintain the seal against the displacement ring. As the veins move out of the slotted rotor, the volume between the veins changes. An increase in the distance between the displacement ring and the rotor causes an increase in the volume. The increase in volume creates a slight vacuum that allows the inlet oil to be pushed into the space between the veins by atmospheric or tank pressure. As the rotor continues to rotate, a decrease in the distance between the displacement ring and the rotor causes a decrease in the volume. The oil is pushed out of that segment of the rotor into the outlet passage of the pump. The vein pump just described is known as the unbalanced vein pump. Figure 60 shows the balanced design principle. 
This design has opposing sets of inlet and outlet ports. Since the ports positioned exactly opposite each other, the high forces generated at the outlet ports cancel each other out. This prevents side loading of the pump shaft and bearings and means that the shaft and bearings only have to carry the torque load and external loads. Since there are two lobes to the cam ring for revolution, the displacement of the pump is equal to twice the amount of fluid which is pumped by the veins. Moving from one inlet to its corresponding outlet, piston pump. Most piston pumps and motors have similar or common parts and use the same nomenclature. The pump parts in the figure 61 are the head. 1. Housing. 2. Shaft. 3. Pistons. 4. Port plate. 5. Barrel. 6. And the swash plate. 7. The two designs of piston pumps are the axial piston pump and the radial piston pump. Both pumps are highly efficient positive displacement pumps. However, the output of some pumps is fixed and the output of some pumps is variable. Axial piston pumps. The fixed displacement axial piston pumps and motors are built in a straight housing or in angled housing. The basic operation of piston pumps and motors are the same. Straight housing axial piston pumps and motors. Figure 62 shows an illustration of the positive displacement fixed output axial piston pump and the positive displacement variable output axial piston pump. Most publications assume that the fact that both pumps are positive displacement and refer to the pumps as fixed displacement pumps and variable displacement pumps. In the fixed displacement axial piston pumps, the pistons move backward and forward in a line that is near parallel to the center line of the shaft. In the straight housing piston pump shown in figure 62, the pistons are held against a fixed wedge-shaped swash plate. The angle of the swash plate controls the distance the pistons move in and out of the barrel. Chambers. The larger the angle of the wedge-shaped swash plate, the greater the distance of piston movement and the greater the pump output per revolution. In the variable displacement axial piston pump, either the swash plate or the barrel and port plate may pivot back and forth to change its angle to the shaft. The changing angle causes the output flow to vary between the minimum and maximum settings. Although the shaft speed is held constant, on either pump, when a piston moves backward, oil flows through the intake and displaces the piston. As the pump rotates, the piston moves forward, the oil is pushed out through the exhaust, creating flow into the system. Most piston pumps used on mobile equipment are axial piston pumps. Angled housing axial piston pump. In the angled housing piston pump in figure 63, the pistons are connected to the input shaft by piston necks or spherical piston ends that fit into sockets in a plate. The plate is an integral part of the shaft. The angle of the housing to the shaft centerline controls the distance the pistons move in and out of the barrel chambers. The larger the angle of the housing, the greater the pump output per revolution. The output flow of a fixed displacement piston pump can only be changed by changing the input shaft. Speed. Graphic symbol pump. Pump ISO symbols are distinguished by a dark triangle in a circle. With the point of the triangle pointing toward the edge of the circle. Linear actuators. Actuator is the general term used for the output device of hydraulic systems. Two broad categories are rotary actuators that deliver the power in a rotating or circular motion and linear actuators. Figure 66. That deliver the power in a straight line. Hydraulic cylinder is the most common term for linear actuators. Although other terms such as ram, jack or stroke are frequently used. These other terms often have application specific meanings. So cylinder or hydraulic cylinder will be used to describe the majority of linear actuators. As discussed, power in a hydraulic system is generated initially from a rotating device, such as an IC engine, and converted to fluid flow by pump. The flow is directed through the system to the actuators, where it is converted to rotary power by motors or into linear power by cylinders. It can be said that without actuators, there is no reason for hydraulic systems to exist as the actuator actually does the work. 
Force and motion are produced in a straight line to operate machine implements, e.g. blades, buckets, rippers, etc. Construction linear actuators, figure 67. Seals. Most cylinders have two locations where fluid must be sealed. Across the piston and around the rod. Cylinders must also be sealed between the body and the two heads. There are many different types of seals for each of these purposes depending on the fluid being used, the integrity of the sealing required and the desired service's life. Rod seals are a flexible material that is held against the rod surface by a combination of initial compression. The seal inside diameter is slightly smaller than the rod outside diameter and hydraulic pressure acting against it. A simple no ring seal with backup rings may be used. A lip tight seal is a popular design, although the U cup or V cup packing are most commonly used. Typical seal designs are shown in figure 68. The lip seal is molded material, usually molded onto a metal or hard plastic frame. A coil spring may be inserted over the lip to provide initial contact of the lip to the sliding or rotating surface, as with the U cup or V cup. The concave side of the seal faces the pressure and the lip is forced against the sealing surface by pressure to create a tight seal. Materials used for seals are usually synthetic rubber. Although rubber compounds and plastic compounds are also used, the main criteria for material selection is compatibility with the fluid being used. Wear resistance and temperature conformance. Seal wear depends a great deal on factors other than the material used. Lubrication qualities and cleanliness of the fluid in contact with the seal is by far the most important. Also, for the seal to be lubricated properly, it must be kept wet by the fluid. A perfect seal would be one that prevents all leakage. In practice, however, a minute amount of lubrication film must be present for the seal to slide easily over the mating. Surfaces, in most applications, a seal is considered effective if there is no obviously detected quantity of fluid passing in. There are two basic types of cylinder. One single acting, two double acting, single acting cylinders. Figure 69 is a schematic view of a single acting cylinder. The dark area represents oil under pressure and lighter colored area is oil of tank pressure. Single acting cylinders use pressure oil from one end of the cylinder and provide force in one direction only. They are retracted using the weight of the lid or spring force. Single acting cylinders are rarely used in mobile equipment. The simplest single acting cylinder is the hydraulic ram. Figure 70. Dot. It has only one fluid chamber and exerts force in only one direction. Most are mounted or used vertically and retract by the force of gravity. Practical for long strokes, rams can be found in bottle jacks and automobile hoists. Single acting cylinders apply a force in one direction, relying on gravity or a counterforce to retract. The primary difference between a single acting cylinder and a ram is the single acting cylinder. Uses a piston, and leakage flow past the piston is ported to the reservoir to minimize external leakage. Single acting cylinders are typically used for truck hoists and crane boom. Double acting cylinders. Figure 71 shows a double acting cylinder. Darker shaded oil is oil under pressure and lighter shaded oil is at tank pressure. This is the most common hydraulic actuator used today on mobile equipment. It is used on the implement, the steering and other systems where the cylinder is required to do work in both directions. Double acting means that the cylinder will provide force and movement in each direction. Double acting cylinder. Figure 72. Colon. Perhaps the most popular type of cylinder on mobile equipment. The double acting cylinder exerts force in both directions, extending and retracting. To extend, fluid is ported into the cap end of the cylinder and the rod end port is vented to the reservoir. During retraction, fluid is ported into the rod end of the cylinder and the cap end port is vented to the reservoir. Double acting cylinders are also called differential cylinders because the effective area and therefore volume of each end is different by virtue of the space taken up by the rod area and volume. This differential area and volume causes a different force and velocity during extension and 
retraction. A variation of the double acting cylinder is the double rod cylinder. In this version, the cylinder rod extends through both end caps. Figure 73. Thus equalizing the area and volume between both ends of the cylinder. This equalizes the forces and velocities during extension and retraction. A typical use for double rod cylinders is in power steering application.